Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we are going to be in conversation about the making of the modern world and about the Atlantic world. And when I say the Atlantic world, we are talking about Europe up in the north. We're talking about Africa. We're talking about all of the Americas, including the Caribbean. My guest for this conversation is Howard W. French. Howard French is a professor of journalism at Columbia University. He is a former New York Times bureau chief in the Caribbean, Central America, West and Central Africa, Tokyo, and Shanghai. He's the author of a number of books. His latest book that he joins us for this conversation is called Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. He joins me over Zoom. Howard French, it is a great pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you, Mitch. It's good to be with you. What What is meant, and you write a lot about this, but just for so we know where our, our, our starting point is, what is meant by the age of discovery? Uh, the age of discovery is typically understood, I think, almost universally in terms of the the basic education we get as, let's call it, Westerners, uh, that um, in the 15th century, there was a lust for connections via the sea with East Asia, and that um, Europeans set out uh, initially from Iberia and especially from Portugal, uh, hell-bent on finding a sea route to the East. The East can mean different things. Um, uh, In the first instance, it meant India, um, but eventually it came to mean uh, what we would imagine in a modern uh, way uh, by the term the East, meaning China and all the rest. Um, uh, My book um, uh, tries to explode the notion that this was in fact the starting point of the age of discovery. And uh, I think I do so in a um, incontrovertible way uh, by showing that in the early 15th century, um, uh, the Portuguese, uh, under a, 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 a very young dynasty called the Avis, uh, were p- felt put upon by the Spanish next door. I'm calling them the Spanish, but it was actually Castile. Uh, and that Castile wished to reabsorb uh, Portugal or to absorb Portugal back into its realm. And that Portugal, being one tenth the size of Spain and much poorer than Spain, was desperate to find the wherewithal to resist uh, being uh, re- reabsorbed by, by Castile. Uh, and so um, uh, the Aviz dynasty, led by a persona who has uh, some fame, uh, even down to the present, uh, named Henry the Navigator, uh, set out looking for sources of wealth in the world. And the primary source of wealth in the world that this all begins with was not in the East, but rather was in West Africa. And the reason why West Africa became an obsession for the Portuguese beginning in the early 15th century uh, is pretty much where I begin my uh, account in my book. Um, it, uh, it was all spurred by uh, ex- an extraordinary voyage taken by a, an emperor from a West African kingdom called Mali uh, in the previous century, the 14th century, who set out on a pilgrimage to the Middle East and in specific to Cairo and then to Mecca, uh, uh, during which he traveled with an entourage that measured in the tens of thousands and and bore with him uh, an unheard of amount of gold. Uh, We're talking about tons and tons of gold, which he distributed all along the way, and especially when he reached these two big destination points, Cairo and, and Mecca. And this depressed gold prices throughout the Middle East and the larger Mediterranean world for more than a decade and created a legend. Uh, I say legend, uh, not to suggest that it wasn't true, but but to say uh, how powerfully the news spread in Europe of the existence of wealth in Africa. And this took manifest form in the creation of a number of maps, the most famous of which form is the, the um, cover of my book, uh, the Catalan Atlas, which circulates in Europe in thir- beginning in 1375 and drives home the notion that there's enormous wealth in Africa. And this is what, uh, less than a half century later, uh, results in Prince Henry the Navigator uh, mounting a series of naval explorations that eventually, actually, at another half century hence, late in the 15th century, namely in 1471, the discovery of a major source of gold in what is now the modern state of Ghana. This happens 
more than a decade after Henry the Navigator's death, but it is a continuation of his voyages. And when the Portuguese arrive in what is now modern day Ghana at a place that they came to call Elmina, uh, they discovered gold in such quantities that Portugal came to control, um, conservatively speaking, about a tenth of the known world supply in that metal. And this uh, made Portugal pretty much overnight a prosperous country and gave it the means to subsequently, but only um, after a two decade delay, uh, able to mount a number of other explorations, for example, to what we later uh, assumed to be the goal in the beginning, uh, meaning the East. And the sort of traditional story about all of this is that the Portuguese and, and Europeans and trying to get to East, which was considered at the time India, had to sell around Africa in order to get there. And what you're arguing here is like, no, there was no having to sell around anywhere. They were going to Africa specifically because of this gold. So this is sort of a, a change in the, the narrative. Uh, it's a complete change in the narrative. Um, I, I cite a variety of popular histories um, uh, that actually use the phrase that you have just used, um, navigating their way around Africa. This is really the, the conventional way the story is told. Africa occupies uh, the equivalent of, virtually speaking, of a footnote uh, in the conventional narratives of the 15th century. Uh, the entire goal, as it is presented to us, uh, in classrooms and in most popular histories is reaching Asia. Um, and um, what's perplexing about this is that um, the documentation for the obsession with African gold and African wealth uh, is abundant. This is not some rare document. I wish I could claim that I had discovered some rare document that had been secreted away and lost to history for, for 500 years. That's not the case. Um, the records of uh, the Portuguese obsession with Malian gold from the 15th century is, is is clear. So this raises interesting questions about how did Africa get written out of this history in the first place? And I, I don't have a fully satisfactory answer for that, but I have a tentative beginning of an answer to that. And the tentative beginning to the answer to that that I have uh, managed to come up with is that the subsequent history of European involvement with Africa is so utterly horrible that Europe has had to sustain an idea until the present, until now, until the moment of this conversation we're having, that Africa basically never really amounted to much of anything in the first place. Uh, and therefore, Europeans can be uh, excused for the horrors that transpired in their engagement with Africa. Uh, and these horrors get sort of um, uh, papered over or historically have been papered over by the notion that Europeans were bringing civilization to Africa. And since they were bringing civilization to Africa, well, if a few bad things happened along the way, well, that's terrible. But um, in fact, their intentions weren't entirely uh, ignoble. It is interesting to hear about how gold plays an important role in the story that you're telling. And I couldn't help but also think about, and I'm going to a different time period now, the middle of the 19th century, but think of the, the gold rush where I am in California, the devastation that that meant for the indigenous people here. At the same time, you have a gold rush in Australia, you have a gold rush in uh, South Africa uh, with major consequences for the, the, for the people who were already there. Do you see a connection, any kind of a connection of the story that you're telling, talking about in the 15th century to what we'd see a few hundred years later? Uh, absolutely. So in the epigraph to the first section of the book, I quote, and I can't uh, reproduce the language in, in, in whole for you now, but I quote um, one of the great uh, French historians of the last century, Fernand Brodel, who said uh, something to the effect of gold is not just a matter of money. Gold is civilization itself. That this has been the gold has been at the sort of heart of civilization and especially of Western civilization uh, since uh, time immemorial. Um, and so this is yet another way of, re of, of reintroducing Africa into this story and helping the reader understand how vital this connection with Africa uh, 
uh, was for Iberia first and then for Europe more broadly. I, I want to turn re return back to an, an aspect of your first question, though, that I didn't really address fully. And that is, not only was this so you asked what, what what am I how am I responding to the conventional take on the on the age of discovery? Not only do we get the beginnings of the story wrong. In other words, Portugal wasn't simply looking for a route to Asia. It was, in fact, in the first instance, very explicitly looking for a route to Africa and hoping to discover gold in Africa. But once it discovered the gold, it it spends the next two decades without even trying to get to Asia, which means that. The gold was the these new commercial links centered on gold were so important to Portugal that it essentially forgot about the um, the any notions of an urgency to connect with Asia. And one more really really important thing begins. I make the argument, and I think this is also um, incontrovertible, that it is Portugal's success in finding this incredibly rich source of African gold that spurred Spain to begin funding uh, great um, naval expeditions of this sort of um, discovery missions, if you will, of its own. And that this is what led to, port to Spain uh, providing the means to Columbus to build his little fleet, uh, which eventually, of course, uh, quote unquote, discovers the Americas. Columbus had been a visitor to the court of Spain and to the court of Portugal and to the, port of the court of England and to various other places looking for backers for this uh, uh, this dream of his to prove the existence of a route westward across uh, around the world um, and to Asia. Uh, and nobody had wished to provide, uh, they had all thought uh, Columbus was, you know, his visions were fanciful and that this would, was, would, would not pay off as an investment. It was only when Spain saw what Portugal had managed to achieve in Africa that Spain decided that it had to do something too, simply to be able to keep up. I want to ask more about the Mali Empire in, in, in the 15th century, and then eventually we get the, the Songhai Empire as well. You were mentioned, you were talking about an emperor who went to Egypt, and through all of this, you get these great stories of, of gold that people hear about. And his name was Mansa Musa. Uh, people, people, maybe you know we've heard about this period of time in this empire in recent years in the news because of documents, uh, ancient documents that we still have that were under threat from "quote unquote" extremist uh, groups recently. Tell me more about the role of the the Mali Empire, and in, in, and this is one of the great empires of of civilization. Tell me more about the role of this empire uh, in the story that you tell. So the Mali Empire is actually the successor of an older empire that essentially occupied, roughly speaking, the same geography. And this geography is in a region of West Africa that we call uh, nowadays the Sahel, which is a kind of semi-savanna area that uh, sits uh, up to the north of the forested coastal belt of West Africa and to the south of the Sahara Desert. So it's uh, uh, Sahel actually in Arabic, which is where the word comes from, means shore. And so Sahel, the Sahel s sits on the shore of the Sahara Desert. That's the origin of this name. And so the Malian Empire followed upon the Ghana Empire, which was its precursor in that same region. Uh, Ghana begins somewhere in the 11th century. Uh, um, Mali arises uh, somewhere in the 13th or 14th century. Um, uh, and in the 14th century, um, Mansa Musa, um, who is not an unheard of figure in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, popular media, um, uh, he is the successor of, in some ways, an even more intriguing uh, historical figure, uh, a, 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 a ruler named, a, a Malian ruler named Abu Bakr II. Abu Bakr II, as we have reason to understand, more than a half century before Columbus, had his own dream of discovering a new worlds on the opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, Abu Bakr II, um, according to uh, written accounts, which I will uh, speak to in a moment, um, uh, mounted two expeditions to try to reach the new world. Now, here I'm not making the claim that Africans reached the new world, or that Africans discovered the Americas or anything like this, but 
Uh, there are reasons to believe that Mansa Musa had that aspiration and that he, in fact, mounted two uh, bids to try to figure out what was on the opposite side, the western side of the Atlantic Ocean. What, what, did they, this, what did they think was there? Well, it's a little bit hard to know, and it's a little bit hard to know only because we only have one written account that attests to this. And the written account that we have that attests to this is an interview that Mansa Musa, so Abu Bakr the second successor, the guy who mounts this grand pilgrimage to Cairo and to Mecca, he gives an interview to, so to speak, at the court of the governor of Cairo. And in this discussion with the governor of Cairo, which is recorded contemporaneously by a note taker of the governor of Cairo, Mansa Musa tells about his predecessor. And he says that this predecessor sent out thousands of, um, uh, in the first instance, hundreds of boats to try to get to the western side of the Atlantic. And that first mission uh, fails. The people who mount, he sent, uh, the people he, who he appointed to, to undertake this voyage of discovery return, most of having lost most of the boats. Um, and that Abu Bakr II was so determined that he mounted a subsequent, even larger mission in which he himself took part. And so the ruler sets out at sea himself um, uh, to try to discover something, uh, you know, land on the far side of the ocean. Um, we don't know where this idea originated from in his mind or what he ex expected to discover. What we do know, and this is really interesting, is that um, in the Arab world, already um, hundreds of years before this became conventional wisdom in, in, in the West, the earth was understood to be round already, that, that Arab mathematicians and, and, uh, and cosmologists and, and geographers already had postulated that the earth was round and had reasonably accurate estimations for the circumference of the earth. This is and hundreds so, of years before Copernicus. Hundreds of years, yeah. yes. And so since Mali, from the beginning of its existence as an empire, was in very close intercourse with the Arab world, it's not difficult to imagine that Abu Bakr II, this predecessor of Mansa Musa, would have had would have at, at a minimum received information that the earth was round and therefore there might be something on the other side of the ocean. So that's, that's really the best we can do in terms of trying to understand what he had in mind. When Mansa Musa, as you indicated, went to Cairo, he brought some 60,000 people with him. Uh, 12,000 of those people were slaves. Can you talk to me about slavery at this time and how we go from a hunger by Portugal and Spain and eventually the rest of Europe for a hunger for gold into a hunger for human slavery. And you know, slavery, of course, is as old as civilization. But what's unique and what we end up getting here at some point is racial slavery which is sort of unique to, to sort of the more modern world kind of slavery. How, how do we go from gold to racial slavery? Um, thank you, Mitch. This is a terrific question, and there are lots of things to unpack. So forgive me if I have to answer this in, in a few different uh, uh, forays. Um, so we spoke of Henry the Navigator earlier. Henry the Navigator is obsessed with finding, because these maps have begun circulating in Africa that show Mali as being a gold-rich empire. Uh, Henry the Navigator, Navigator is obsessed with finding the West African sources of gold. He, again, he's not thinking about Asia. He's thinking about Africa. His, uh, his ships, as he is funding these ventures, are inching their way south uh, down the western bulge of Africa and eventually around the bulge to sort of go parallel to the equator, the distance that are required to reach what we now call Ghana. Okay. In the beginning, uh, they were finding almost no gold, uh, and these ventures are very expensive. Uh, and Henry the Navigator was not neither the king nor the crown prince of Portugal, and so his Portugal itself was a fragile and not very wealthy uh, young kingdom. And so Henry the Navigator's means were limited, and there was pressure on him, fiscally speaking, to make these ventures pay off. And so. In the early decades of this exploration, when they were not finding gold, the Portuguese were beginning to raid coastal African uh, societies 
to seize slaves, to take back to Portugal, to sell in Portugal and to Spain, and in some cases, uh, Italy and various other places, but Portugal and Spain especially. And the demand for African slaves in these places was very high uh, in the in the 15th century because Europe was just emerging from the Black Death, and the European demography and late, sort of working age labor force had been decimated. And so there was there was extraordinary demand for let's for this is not um, uh, the sort of correct term nowadays, but manpower. Right, um, and so the Portuguese discovered in the beginning that they could raid slaves, raid society, coastal societies for slaves, kid, essentially kidnapping people by single numbers or by the dozens, take them back to Portugal and sell them there. Eventually, by the way, I'll say parenthetically, um, this um, uh, took on such a momentum that a tenth of Portuguese society in this era comes to be comes to consist of Africans. Uh, this is like something that I I would warrant most Portuguese even have no idea of today. So in the fifteenth, late fifteenth, by the late fifteenth century, early sixteenth century, one tenth of Portugal was black people brought from Africa. Um, uh, similar numbers in in southern Spain and places like Seville. Uh, anyway, the Portuguese figure out that this isn't the most profitable way to go about trying to get slaves. Uh, that African societies, not in a uniform way, but often enough, uh, had quite sophisticated ways of governance and were quite capable of defending themselves and were pretty well organized. And that the Portuguese, being a small, poor country, had difficulty projecting force in ways that would be sufficient to overcome uh, African defenses. And therefore, the Portuguese, with these uh, slave raids, were losing men um, in substantial number. Uh, and so they began to have what I'll call political relationships with African societies in which they begin uh, with the more organized and, and sophisticated of these African societies in which they were they expressed their interest in buying people from them. And the African societies, in many cases, begin to sell slaves to the Portuguese. Now, um, you said slavery has been uh, pretty much a universal feature of human society, which is true across time in every society, pretty much there has been slavery and for long stretches of history, this is all true. But in the African milieu, there was nothing like the type of slavery that we come to associate with the New World. By the way, for the Portuguese, the New World doesn't exist yet either in the in this beginning era that we're talking about. But in African societies, the convention of slavery as it existed back then was you have a war against a neighboring people, you capture the defeated uh, men and uh, their womenfolk, and you absorb them into your society. You make them work for some time, but they, they're not reduced to um, the equivalent of, of chattel. Chattel is the word that we have used for plantation society in the Western Hemisphere. Chattel is derived from the same Latin root as cattle. And that expresses very well what we mean by this new form, what became a new form of Western slavery in, in the plantation world, where Africans were reduced essentially to beasts of burden. Right, so so the Africans who were selling the slaves to the Portuguese early in this era had no idea, a that there would ever be a new world, b that there could be there could be a form of slavery in which the slaves were reduced to chattel, um, and they had these longstanding traditions of their own of capturing slaves among their uh, defeated enemies and absorbing them into their societies. You mentioned the, the successor to the Mali Empire a few moments ago, which was called Songhai. Um, an emperor of Songhai was, was the son of a slave. Um, this is how fully slaves were, fully and quickly, slaves were integrated into African societies without any lingering taint of inferiority or of racial caste, or of anything like that in the African milieu. And so the Africans are selling slaves to the Portuguese with no notion that it could be for any other purpose than this, right? And the Portuguese begin taking the slaves to Europe, and a very thriving trade in, in humans begins to sort of establish itself in Southern Europe. And then eventually, the Portuguese arrive in Ghana at the place called Elmina, which is the, this, the place of this grand first giant discovery of gold. And the Portuguese uh, 
for a time uh, stop being obsessed with slaves. Slave, this was gold was their objective all along, and now they've hit the mother load, right? And so, so the Portuguese become uh, preoccupied with trying to make as much money for gold for the next few decades. And along the way, as they do so, they're continuing to explore further east and then south along the African coast um, to the point where they reach um, a place that we know as Congo today, the country of Congo and that region of West Central Africa today, where they encounter a very sophisticated kingdom, which we call the Congo Kingdom, Congo in this instance spelled with a K. And the Portuguese um, uh, begin to establish um, uh, very elaborate political relations with, with the Congo Kingdom, which they see as really, politically speaking, peers of theirs, very sophisticated. Um, uh, and the Portuguese, uh, at around the same time, discover an island off the coast of Africa in that same West Central um, African area called Sao Tome, a very small place, um, which is equatorial uh, and mountainous and volcanic and incredibly fertile. And so the Portuguese then begin to plant sugar on that island, but sugar... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sugar is one of the most disagreeable and burdensome crops known to mankind uh, for farming. And so the Portuguese uh, begin to trade for slaves in West Central Africa and in another kingdom called Benin to farm sugar in this new institutional arrangement called chattel, which I described earlier, on Sao Tome. And just a few years after the discovery of Sao Tome, the Portuguese discover Brazil. And this sets off a race to colonize the new world and to establish plant plantation agriculture in the new world, which becomes um, uh, more lucrative by far, even than gold. And in fact, more lucrative also by far than what would soon become the big trade in spice and silver, I'm sorry, spice and silk and tea and things like that in the East. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Howard W. French. Howard French is a professor of journalism at Columbia University. He's a former New York Times bureau chief in the Caribbean and Central America, West and Central Africa, Tokyo, and Shanghai. We are in conversation about his book, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. I don't want to get too sidetracked here and, and off the linear projection that we have going on here on, but I was fascinating and I did not know about the role that the Black Death, the bubonic plague in Europe the century before would play in this story. Uh, we've done shows on uh, the plague of Europe during this period of time, and sometimes I put emphasis on how as devastating as it was, I mean, many places lost around half of its population, it actually created opportunities for a peasant revolt, opportunities for workers to uh, improve their, their standing uh, because you just had less workers, which I never realized I got from your book. This would also lead, however, to an increase for, quote unquote, again, as you said, manpower and hence would lead directly in a straight line to inevitable, or I don't know, to eventual racial slavery. Correct. Yeah. Your, your story is a big story. Um, how, how do you move from this period to the next period that you tell? So um, I, what I've just said in the last, I don't know, three, four or five minutes of our conversation is a highly compressed version of, of sort of the early middle portions of my book. Um, uh, the early portions of the book are concerned with the age of discovery and the importance of gold and exploding the myth of, you know, Asia being the be all and end all of, of, of Western curiosity about the world and restoring Africa to the narrative. And then, then the second, the subsequent stage of the book um, uh, is really about the movement of uh, this new mode of production called uh, plantation slavery using chattel labor from the old world to the new world. Um, and in the year 1500, the Portuguese accidentally discover Brazil. Uh, they go a period of decades go by where the Portuguese are really kind of puzzled. They're not really sure what to make of Brazil. They, the Brazil is obviously immense, so immense that it seems almost endless in its extensiveness. Um, but they don't discover anything of obvious, great, immediate, and easily exploitable value. Um, 
there's no they don't discover gold in any quantity or silver for that matter in any quantity it's kind of funny because 100 years later they would discover a lot of gold but in the, those early decades the portuguese thought of brazil as kind of a um a, a wash right um uh, they had brazil wood which was used as a dye and they had you know uh, various other commodities like that but nothing of, of super high value um <clears throat> and so um uh, Sugar, the sugar plantation chattel slavery model gets implemented and refined on Sao Tome, and that then makes the leap uh, to Brazil. And by the middle middle to late middle uh, 16th century, uh, Brazil, uh, Portuguese in Brazil begin in various places along the coast, Bahia and Pernambuco, especially those regions of Brazil, to establish hugely extensive um, chattel slave driven sugar operations. Now you must understand <clears throat> sugar in the 15th century was uh, an extremely refined sugar, was an extremely rare and extremely expensive luxury item. Uh, only royalty and members of the high aristocracy were able to consume sugar uh, uh, in any quantity back in that era because it was so expensive. For many others, it was actually considered a medicinal. That's how rare it was. Um, now, for the first time, uh, you have in Brazil um, uh, extensive sugar plantations that are run and operated on this incredibly profitable but also incredibly brutal production system called chattel slavery. And Portugal begins to reap an extraordinary windfall from this. Um, this uh, would, in a short period of time, so I said that Portugal acquired in Elmina one-tenth of the known world supply of gold. Portugal and Brazil would, in a short period, in a matter of three decades late in the 16th century, begin to make far more money from growing sugar than even it could make by controlling one tenth of the supply of the known supply of the world's gold, um, and this it did through um, ex brutally expropriated black labor on these plantations, where people's life, the Africans' life expectancy was ex was typically reckoned to be between five and seven years, and the whole idea was you just simply replace them. You don't try to to shepherd them or to kind of make them extend their life, their productive lifespans. It wasn't worth it according to the business model calculations of the era. Just bring new Africans. Um, and, and so a variety of interesting things begin to happen in Europe. Um, at this point, um, uh, Holland, or the, um, yeah, so let's just call it Holland, um, which had been a, essentially a colony of Spain's uh, rebels against uh, Holland is predominantly Protestant in this era rebels against Spanish control, uh, and Spain, Spain and Portugal, uh, these two kingdoms, which have mo for, had through most of their histories been bitter rivals, they fused. Um, and so Holland decided that the best way that it could resist um, Spain was to attack Portugal, because Portugal was the source of the, the 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 most lucrative source of profit for this condominium between Spain and Portugal. What do I mean? I mean the sugar windfall from Brazil was the most riotously wealth-producing thing that existed in this new Spanish Portuguese world. Right, more than the famous gold and silver of the New World that we have heard so much about. And so the Dutch attacked um, the Portuguese holdings in Brazil for a time take over some of the plantations of Bahia um, in, in Brazil and run them for their own purposes. The Dutch had not until that point big, been big players in the slave trade, but they came to understand that in order, quickly that in order to run plantations on this scale, they needed uh, free labor. Uh, and so they began also to get into the slave trade in a big way. Um, <clears throat> And eventually, I'm compressing now um, a history that goes from 14, 1580 to 1640, when when the Portuguese and the Spanish get become sort of enter into divorce and separate again. Um, the, the 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 Dutch are defeated in the end, and Dutch sugar technology and perhaps even sugar growers themselves move into the Caribbean. And this is just in the beginning of the era when England and France uh, were beginning to establish 
colonies of their own in the lower Antilles, meaning the small islands of the Caribbean that are far away from the shores of the United States and closer to South America. Um, the, 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 the English make the first big breakthrough there in the island of Barbados. In the 1630s, they begin to plant sugar. They import know-how from Dutch Brazil. Uh, and again, we see a repeat of this story within the space of essentially three decades. Sugar takes off in a way that had never actually been seen before, uh, even by the standards of Brazil. And England, subsequently Britain, is making more money from sugar via slavery than it had made through any imperial venture uh, in its history. And in fact, uh, in its future history, uh, Portu uh, Barbados becomes the most profitable place in the history of British Empire for a period of more than 100 years. And, and this launches Britain in a way um, that is uh, insufficiently recognized, I argue, in the empire game. This gives Britain the wherewithal, just as African slavery had given Portugal the wherewithal, to become uh, an explorer, expansionist, sort of imperial, uh, imperial oriented uh, society. How does Haiti fit into this story? And you do have a chapter called Black Jacobins. Of course, that's what mm -hmm. C.L.R. James called the Haitian revolutionaries in the in the late uh, 18th century. Right. Um, so, so this is um, uh, Haiti is a follow-on story. Uh, the spread of this chattel slavery plantation um, uh, production model spreads throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it begins, as we saw in Brazil, it go, and then goes to Barbados. The English sub subsequently expel uh, the Spanish from Jamaica and take over Jamaica. And Jamaica, uh, uh, you know, uh, 80 years after Barbados becomes a big, you know, arrival. Uh, for the crown of biggest sugar pr producer and eventually becomes Britain's biggest uh, uh, wealth producing colony. Um, the French were a few decades behind the, the English in this curve of, of uh, imposing the plantation model through chattel slavery in the Western Hemisphere, but eventually they got there. And in the early 18th century, they uh, the French um, uh, invest themselves wildly in producing sugar in a place that was then known as Hispaniola. They controlled the western third of that island. Uh, the other eastern thir two thirds of it were controlled by Spain, uh, and this becomes in an extraordinary. So the so the one of the remarkable things of all this history is this a, a repeat of a phenomenon we see over and over again, where one place after another becomes the most extraordinarily wealth producing thing in the history of Western relations with another part of the world. So we first see it in Sao Tome, then we see Brazil surpass Sao Tome in that regard for Portugal, then we see England copy Brazil in a little tiny place called Barbados, which then becomes the most wildly successful, economically speaking, colony uh, ever seen. And then this goes to Jamaica. So the last stop in this story um, uh, in uh, bar one, um, which we'll come to, is, is Haiti, uh, then known as Hispaniola. Uh, in the 18th century, starting in the 1830s, um, and then sort of accelerating throughout that century, uh, um, Saint-Domingue, as the French called their part of Hispaniola, becomes the richest colony in the history of mankind, richer than even Jamaica and Barbados and Brazil. Uh, it is producing an extraordinary amount of France's external trade. Uh, it is uh, responsible for um, a huge portion of France's growth in national wealth throughout this era. Um, and um, it does so at the cost, at an extraordinary cost of human lives. Uh, France is employing, if we can use that verb, um, slaves within, in numbers and with an intensity that surpass even what we had seen previously in Jamaica and in Barbados, and just burning through people, working them to death, like grinding them up, as you might imagine, in a, hum in a mill that's just crushing lives to produce sugar. Um, and eventually the Haitian uh, slaves revolt. Uh, they were not Haitian yet. Uh, the end of the revolt is the birth of the nation that we now know as Haiti in 1804. But the, the, these slaves revolt 
And over a period of more than a decade, the, they uh, managed to see off two attempts by the French to reimpose their control on the island, uh, an attempt by the Spanish to defeat them, uh, and two attempts by the English or then by then the British to defeat them. Now, this is really one of the most extraordinary stories, I think, uh, in all of human history, how um, a, a, a nation was born out of a population of slaves uh, who are driven by a determination to freedom um, and how they defeat the greatest imperial forces of the era. Both France and England excuse me, sent the greatest naval expeditions each of them had ever sent anywhere in the world up until that point to try to defeat the Haitian slaves, and the Haitian slaves won. Um, where this becomes really, really interesting is where it, how it leads. To, I mean, that's interesting enough in itself, I think, but where it becomes interesting in, in ways that I think are surprising for American audiences is how it leads to the creation of the ultimate colony, um, and that ultimately colony is what I call the American South. I don't mean colony in terms of the American South being a colony by this point uh, of the British or of another foreign pol power, but of a kind of a colonial economy uh, in the American South where uh, the colonized are in effect uh, slaves whose ancestors were brought from Africa. And the colonizers are, in effect, a, a white population who, in the most plantation-intense parts of the American South, were, in fact, a minority. Um, and so the Haitians defeated the French in, um, uh, in uh, Hispaniola, in Saint-Domingue in 1804. They create a new nation. And, and Napoleon, who was the emperor of Haiti at this time, had multiple ambitions in terms of military and global power at this time, many of which were centered in Europe. And he had lost so many men and so much treasure in Haiti that he signed uh, an agreement with the T Jefferson administration to sell off the entire Louisiana Purchase, this vast holding that France had uh, in the Mississippi Valley and beyond, all or part of 15 states, what became 15 states in the United States, about a third of the country that he sold to the Jefferson administration because he was desperate financially. And this opened up the Mississippi Valley for cotton exploitation, for the migration of vast numbers of slaves from Virginia and the Carolinas uh, and Georgia westward to the Mississippi Valley were, for the first time, they were put in uh, production of, employed in the production of cotton. And cotton becomes the next big miracle crop. Cotton in the first half of the uh, 18th century, I'm sorry, the 19th century becomes uh, the engine of American growth. It becomes the preeminent by far American export. Uh, it becomes the basis of the Industrial Revolution itself, because cotton is the ingredient that English textiles are made from, and without which there couldn't have been the Industrial uh, Revolution as, as we know it. Um, this is re really the motor of the American growth story of the 19th century. And all of this you can trace back to Haiti, because the slaves defeated France in Haiti. France had to sell the Mississippi Valley, which sets in motion all of these changes. We are almost out of time, and sir, you are more than welcome to come back and continue this conversation in another episode if you're up for it. But I want to end on this then, and going on along this line that you just drew for us from, from gold to sugar to cotton. And I guess this is where we see the marriage of capitalism and racial slavery. Talk to me a little bit more than... What's that dynamic from gold to sugar to cotton after cotton? What, what, what would it be in the, the 20th century? Well, so, you know, cotton leads in, uh, in, a, in an indirect and complicated way to the Civil War. Uh, the North is industrializing too. And the South is not industrializing anywhere near to the same degree or at the same rhythm. Uh, and this introduces a number of complicated d dynamics between these two parts of the young American Republic, uh, with the North seeing its future in 
um, things like free trade and in the limitation of the spread of slavery and in industrialization and in what we nowadays call services, banking and things like that, right? And the, and the South seeing its future tied much more closely to the land and explicitly to the exploitation of black labor through slavery. Um, uh, I, I, you know, um, there's with the Civil War, we see a rupture uh, uh, which seems quite decisive initially, right? The Civil War ends with the end of slavery. By the way, I explain in the book in some detail how uh, great the African-American contribution was to the victory of the North in the Civil War, which is a story that's poorly told or not w told very much in conventional sort of teachings of American history and in, in our civics and history classes. Um, <clears throat> but the book goes on from there to talk about how um, this um, initial sort of miraculous period in the immediate post-Civil War era actually comes to an end. Um, there is a reconstruction, which is what that uh, uh, period's uh, formal name is in, 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 in history terminology, where Blacks are given land and uh, allowed into American political life and guaranteed certain rights, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is a revanchist effort by the South in which the North essentially sort of collaborates. It essentially concedes. It says that, well, it's not really worth antagonizing the white power structure in the South uh, if it's going to mean continued disunity between the two parts of the country. So let's turn a blind eye to whatever they're doing down there, right? <clears throat> and um, so th to return to your question more explicitly, the, the sort of final big phase where I end the book really is with uh, the invention of technologies that allow um, uh, Black people, African Americans, to leave the land and to leave the Jim Crow era uh, oppression of the South um, and begin migrating in very large numbers to other parts of the country, most famously to to Illinois, to Chicago, but actually to Los Angeles and to, you know, the Carol North, you know, to, to back to Virginia and points north of Virginia and, 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 and even more unexpected places in the Midwest or, or Northwest, right? Um, and and the, the sort of beautiful but ironic feature of this is in the, in the post-Reconstruction era, all of the laws that were sort of designed by the white political power structure in the United States in that era were aimed at keeping blacks in a, peer, in a position of dependence and inferiority and tying them to menial jobs, making the refusal to do menial jobs actually a crime, uh, making it uh, a crime not to work, making it impossible not to, making it impossible to hunt or to fish or to do things to farm on a small scale that could ensure your livelihood in freedom so that, that Black people were, were, were obliged essentially to work as sharecroppers or in peonage in various ways. With the invention of these new kinds of technologies, which I alluded to a moment ago, um, especially the cotton thresher, um, uh, suddenly um, uh, white people in the cotton producing areas of the South, in the Mississippi Valley especially, understood that they didn't need black labor anymore. And in fact, because black people were, were, were pushing for um, the return of their rights, they saw the presence of blacks in large numbers a threat to continue white dominance and welcomed the departure of black people from their midst. And so this leads to the third ma great migration that is described in the course of uh, this book's long history. I speak about 600 years of history in this in this book. The first great migration, of course, is across the Atlantic. More than 12 million people brought in chains to work as chattel slaves in the New World. Many, many more millions dying in Africa in the process and in at sea along the way. Second great migration is after the Haitian victory over France and other European powers, in which uh, the, most of the North American slave population moves from the old South of Virginia, the Carolinas, et cetera, to the Mississippi Valley. And now finally we arrive at this third great migration, which is the movement of African-Americans freed by 
uh, the arrival of new technologies in part uh, to move into other parts of the of the of the of the United States where previously they had constituted a very small part of the population again Chicago but Los Angeles uh, the the northeast the northwest etc and so my story essentially ends there Howard W French has been our guest Howard French is a professor of journalism at Columbia University and he has joined us for a conversation about his book, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. When, when we're in the old media of radio, we have, we, we have what I call the tyranny of the clock, sir, but that was wonderful. You are welcome to come back on this show uh, to talk more about this in the future. But for now, I thank you dearly for taking this time today. It would be my pleasure to come back, Mitch. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much.